what does the REV mean for you? Again, as I mentioned just now, this is based on my experience this year only. Um, I'm sure there's others in the audience that have been involved in the REV, um, either in this one or in previous ones. So if you have experience to share, by all means do that later on in the session. REV is the abbreviation of the Research Excellence Framework, which uh, to me is a slightly bombastic um, term. Um, it's about measuring research performance um, in uh, universities, uh, but it used to be called the Research Assessment Exercise, which was a far more factual description, I think. Now it's called the Research Excellence Framework. I think it's meant to be more aspirational and possibly more motivating. I don't know what the rationale behind the change of name was, but it is conducted um, every six to seven years in the UK on a national level. And it has been going since the 1980s, although the format has changed uh, in that period. It is conducted um, in individual units of assessment. So every discipline has its own unit of assessment. And business and management is a discipline um, as a whole uh, and um, is one of the biggest uh, units of assessment. Uh, disciplines such as um, economics have their own unit of assessment. So this is purely about business and management. Um, it's a hugely administrative exercise that will take up most of a research dean's job for uh, the year, uh, the final year of the submission period. And its key functions are really to um, be accountable for public funding of research because um, obviously most universities in the UK are publicly funded and all publicly funded universities have to participate in the REF. It also serves as a benchmarking of universities, so to see where they stand vis-a-vis uh, -vis each other. And most importantly for most universities, it is used to allocate um, research funding to universities. So the higher the ranking of a university in the REF, the larger the amount of funding they will receive from the government. But that is not even the most important outcome of the REF. Um, the most important outcome of the REF for most universities is the fact that it creates a ranking list that ranks the universities on a national level for each discipline. And this ranking tends to have a huge influence on a university's reputation. And with that reputation, it also influences its student and staff recruitment. So the indirect effect on a university's income is much larger than simply the funding it gets based on the assessment. So I mentioned that one of the key um, outcomes of the research excellence uh, framework is a ranking of universities. There is a, a weekly publication in the UK, Research Fortnight, actually a, probably a two-weekly uh, publication then, um, that after the REF uh, has concluded does a ranking of universities based on two criteria, what they call the quality ranking and the power ranking. The quality ranking looks at how universities scored um, on the quality criteria, and we'll discuss those in a bit more in a minute. Um, and the power ranking actually multiplies that quality ranking by the number of people working in the unit of assessment. So if you look at this quality ranking, you can see here, for instance, that Cambridge is at the top of the list of the quality ranking, which won't be a surprise uh, for, for many of you. But if you then look at the power ranking, you see that Cambridge is only ranked 13. So the reason for that is hidden behind my head, and I need to go that way, in that Cambridge only has 29 members of staff, and I'll move me to the top so you can actually see that. Cambridge only has 29 members of staff, or is it 39? It's 39. Um, so that's much less than, for instance, Manchester, which is ranked 15 on the quality rankings, but it's ranked three on the power rankings because it has 122 
staff members in business and management. So even though um, the publication output and the impact case studies and the research environment that we'll talk about later were ranked slightly lower for Manchester than for Cambridge in terms of the overall funding that Manchester will receive, they are ranked three because they have far more staff members and the ranking overall, the power ranking is higher. So this has resulted in uh, different types of games being played by universities, with some universities trying to get high up the quality ranking and not submitting as many members of staff. And then other universities saying, we want to maximize the power ranking. We submit a large number of people and we maximize our funding. So there's all these games being played. And those were the games that were played in the last REF, the 2014 REF. Things have changed slightly. Um, in every exercise so far, um, we've had three things that were measured. First of all, publications. Second, research impact. And research impact is not academic impact. So it doesn't measure citations. It measures societal impact. And we'll look into that a little bit more um, in a minute. And then there's a research environment, which is basically a big statement about um, the research environment that researchers in every university operate in. In this presentation, I'll focus mostly on the publications because these are the ones that are most relevant for individual academics. If we then move to the individuals, the individual researchers, um, the first question to ask is who is included in the REF and what are they included with? And in this respect, the current REF is very different from the previous REF. And this is where a lot of junior academics who have been involved in the previous REF get confused because they haven't been fully briefed about what the differences are. In the previous REF, um, the university could decide to submit some people to the REF and not others. So they would submit only the researchers with the highest level of publications and only the researchers that had at least four what they thought were good publications. So there was a lot of game playing with universities said we're not going to include you in the ref because that will decrease our average. However, in the current ref. There is no longer this choice because the university has to submit every academic working in the institution that is on a research and teaching contract or a research only contract. So regardless of whether they have published or whether they have published at a high level, they need to include this staff member. Obviously, that has led universities to engage well, not obviously, sadly, this has led universities to engage in another kind of game playing in that um, they have tried to change academics contracts. So people who were traditionally on a research and teaching contract, some of them have been asked to change to a teaching only contract because then they don't need to be submitted to the REF. Obviously, these are hugely disturbing uh, discussions uh, for individual academics, especially if they feel they are doing research, um, they just haven't managed to get to that top level yet. Um, so um, very different systems, very different consequences for individual academics. Then in 2014, um, universities could only submit staff who were imposed at the census date, and the census date is July this year. So anyone who um, was imposed at the census date um, could be submitted. So even people who were appointed two weeks before the census date could be submitted to the REF. And I see Louisa smiling and she's um, experienced enough to realize what the effect of that was that people started to appoint academics with very good publication records just months uh, before the census date. In the new REF, this is no longer the case uh, because publications stay with the institution, even if a staff member leaves. 
So if a staff member leaves halfway uh, during the seven year period, the publications in the first half of the period stay with their old university. Their new publications go with their new university. So very different system. The only thing is that for this ref only for 2021, um, they have decided to go midway in a sense that you can submit publications both from staff who are currently here and staff who were there in the past. So you kind of double dip, but they've done this because these rules were changed relatively late um, and they didn't want um, universities and academics um, to get too upset about this. So then the next question I think a lot of people had is, well, who actually evaluates my publications? And there's two answers to this. It first happens within the university uh, before uh, the submission is put together. And then it happens in the actual um, evaluation at the national level. The evaluation at the next national level will happen next year in 2021. And that's done by a panel of academics. And there's usually about 30 or 40 in each unit of assessment. Um, and they are usually senior academics. Most of them are professors, not all of them. Uh, and they are appointed through open nomination. You can self nominate, other people can nominate you. So that's a small group of academics. Um, from usually from the UK, although there are also some international academics there. But first of all, publications are evaluated within the university. But how that happens within the university is really dependent on the rules that your university have set for this. And the university can set their own rules. So at Middlesex, uh, what we have done is we've asked individuals to tell us what they think are their best publications and rank their publications. Other universities might not do this and they might say, you submit your publications and we are going to all read them and then we are going to decide what the best publications are. Yet other universities might um, ask people from outside the university to look at your publications and decide what the best publications are. So every university um, has their own procedures. We have decided to rely first and foremost on the individual staff members opinion, and then also look at uh, external rankings such as the ABS journal ranking that um, is very commonly used in the UK. There's all sorts of issues with the ranking, with the ABS ranking. We won't have time to go into that today, but this is the method we have chosen uh, at Middlesex. A key reason why uh, we have chosen to rely on self-nomination and external metrics of quality is that we didn't want to run into the issue that we've seen in other universities where individual academics are evaluating someone else's, a colleague's piece of work, um, and you get into all sorts of conflicts. Why did you think? My article, which I think was a wonderful article. Why do you think this should only be ranked two? I think it should be ranked four. So it creates a lot of work, but it also creates a lot of potential for collegial conflicts within the university. And we thought that was absolutely not worth uh, the risk. So you will also have heard about um, the star ratings. Um, if you are in the UK or if you have looked at the, the ref at all, um, you will know that there are four star ratings, four star, three star, two star, and one star. What is important to know is that even though obviously four star is higher than three star and two star, even two star research is research that is recognized internationally in originality. So it's not like it's rubbish research. And people often say, well, anything that's below four star is not worthwhile. I think if you look at the definitions, that's clearly not true. Because even two star research and, what, and three star research is recognized internationally or internationally excellent. So if you are a junior academic, don't let people tell you that your research is only valuable if it's scored four star. But then 
the question is, what actually is internationally excellent or internationally recognized? That's, that's quite a vague way of saying it. So what the individual um, units of assessments have done is they have tried to operationalize this. And this is the operationalization that is used in panel C, which is the panel for the social sciences, which is the panel that business and management is part of. So if you look at uh, what you need to do in your publication to qualify for a four star ranking, outstandingly novel, a primary or essential point of reference, formative influence on the intellectual agenda, exceptionally rigorous research design and exceptionally significant data set or research resource. That's a really, really high standard to meet. Um, so if you look at the three star novel, important, very important, robust, substantial, that's already quite significant um, to meet as well. So again, don't think that only research that's ranked four star um, is an important contribution to the field. Um, there's also research impact, which is not something I'll go into into any detail. Uh, we will discuss this in a bit more detail next year when we have a separate se session on the REF. And Emily, one of our participants today, will also talk about uh, research impact case studies um, at that stage. But basically, they are um, evidence that your research has, has an impact on society. It has in some way benefited the economy, the society, culture, public policy, health, the environment, but it has to be beyond academia. But it's not the case that every academic has to write an impact case study. A university needs to submit an impact case study roughly for every 10 academics they submit. So at Middlesex University, we're submitting seven impact case studies. So for an individual academic, publications are far more relevant for uh, the REF than impact case studies. However, if you have research that has clear societal impact, um, it is a very important contribution to the REF. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in your questions because some people asked, well, is it really worth investing time in writing up an impact case study? Does that mean anything for my career? If you want to know more about REF impact case studies, there's a couple of really nice books uh, on this. Um, there's also, um, you can also download all the impact case studies that have been submitted for the 2014 REF if you want to get a brief idea of how these things are written. And if you want to get a, a feel for the type of research that is typically used to write up impact case studies, here are the ones that we are submitting in the current REF uh, at Middlesex University. So then the final elements of the REF is the research environment statement. And that's basically um, a statement of anywhere between 6,000 and 12,000 words, depending on the number of people that you are submitting that describes the research environment in which um, the research takes place. So typically as an individual academic, you won't have much to do with this. It's typically the research dean and one or two other senior academics who will be writing up this statement. However, they might ask individual academics for input because for instance, there's also a section about uh, esteem indicators, whether you've won major awards, whether you're a part of editorial boards, whether you're an editor for a journal, whether you've organized major conferences, whether you've maybe given a keynote speech uh, somewhere. So typically universities will ask you for input on this, but that's the only thing that you will normally do as an individual academic. So what does this mean for you? Well, again, a lot depends on the university. 
Um, in some universities, um, it might make the difference between being on a research and teaching contract and a teaching only position. If a university feels that um, your research output isn't good enough to submit to the REF, um, they might suggest that you go on a teaching only contract. There have been some universities who've clearly played games uh, with this. Um, and in some universities, sadly, it might even mean redundancy if you don't accept a teaching only contract. So for some individuals, it might have a significant impact if the university feels that they're not meeting the requirements for the REF. In other universities, it may mean very little at all. Um, so it really depends on your university. And I think this is important to realize is not that the REF prescribes all of this. It is a constraining environment that we have to operate in as universities, but it is not that the REF forces universities to put people on teaching only contract. These are decisions that individual universities make. Um, what I will say though, is that in business schools in the UK, the norms for evaluating the quality of publications in both the REF and performance appraisal are tightly linked to REF norms. So senior managers are looking at your publication profile to some extent in the context of the REF. However, um, if we talk about uh, the journal rankings that are often used to evaluate your publications, it's really confusing because these journal rankings are also one to four star, but they're not the same as the REF one to four star. They are the same in a sense that four is highest and one is lowest, but they're not identical. So it doesn't mean if you have a publication in a four star journal, that it will be ranked in the REF as four star. Because if we go back to this matrix, it will be ranked four star if the panel thinks that the publication is outstandingly novel, has a formative influence, is exceptionally rigorous. It might be more likely that that's the case if the publication is published in a four star journal, but it doesn't have to be. In the last REF, the REF 2014, they actually did a brief analysis where they took a sample of, sorry, it was a thousand publications, not 100 publications. Um, and they compared how these publications scored on the ABS journal ranking. So whether they were published in a one-star journal, a two-star journal, a three-star journal, or a four-star journal, or a journal that was not ranked at all. And then they looked at how they were scored in the REF. So what you can see here is that even publications that are ranked in a, that are published in a four star journal are more likely, slightly more likely to be ranked three star than four star. So there is an even chance as to whether your publication will be ranked three or four star if it's published in a four star journal. If it's published in a three star journal, the highest likelihood is that it will be ranked three star, but it might also be ranked four star. It might be ranked two star or it might even be ranked one star. And again, even a publication in a two star journal, there are some that were ranked four star. There's a, quite a number that were ranked three star. And there are even some that were ranked one star. So again, the star ranking of journals is not identical to the REF ranking, but it is true that a publication in a four-star journal has a substantially higher likelihood of being ranked four-star in the REF, three times as, as likely as a three-star publication and 10 times as likely as a two-star publication. What does it mean for you in the future? And this is the last slide I wanted to um, discuss. I think what it will mean in the future beyond this ref that publications in top journals will remain important. And then increasingly um, universities will start looking at publications, not just in 
four-star journals on the ABS list, but in what we call journals of distinction. Some people call them five-star journals. So they're the elite group within the four-star journals. It's a very small group of journals. In addition to that, research funding will become increasingly important and research impacts will become increasingly important. So if you are currently a junior career academic, don't think about your um, academic portfolio only as publications. Funding and research impact are going to be important as well. If you want to know more, here are some resources and obviously I will post the slides um, in the blog post that I will write up. Um, so there's no need to make a note of them right now. And there were a lot of questions um, you had already. And I see that um, there are more questions in the chat as well. I will leave it to um, one of the other Signa team to let me know the questions uh, in the chat. Uh, but we will go quickly through the questions that you've already submitted um, in um, the spreadsheet. Um, so the first question was, how many publications do I need? Well, I hope that the presentation has given you an answer to this um, already. Um, you only really need one because everyone can be submitted with just one publication. Well, not everyone. Um, people can be submitted with just one publication as long as the average for the university is two and a half. So if some of your, your colleagues are submitted with five publications, and you are submitted with one, the average is already three. So junior career academics, um, they are often submitted with only one or two publications. So if you have one or two good publications over a seven year period, that's already sufficient. So you don't have to have three, four star publications a year. Um, you don't necessarily even have to have three, four star publications over a seven year period. Obviously, if you do have them, or if you have five, the university will be extremely happy with you. Um, and um, they will be more likely to promote you as well, obviously. Then the second question, do all type of publications count? Um, as you saw from one of the previous slides, books um, have also been submitted and they were typically rated quite highly which is in a way not surprising because a, a book is a very substantial uh, piece of work. Um, so yes, you can submit any type of publications. You can even submit conference papers. You can submit practitioner articles, but conference papers and practitioner articles are not likely to be ranked very highly. So the university will prefer you to submit journal articles or books. And then um, a question, so what happens if outputs are accepted around now? So towards the very end um, of the REF period, uh, and they are possibly not yet published in online first, or they might be published in online first on Christmas day or on, on New Year's Eve. Um, are they going to submit it to this REF or can they also be submitted to the next one. Um, they can certainly be submitted to the next one. However, if it is a four-star publication, your university will likely um, pressure you to include it in this ref because it will increase um, their ranking for this ref. So again, there might be a bit of um, negotiation there, uh, but um, I think many academics who published articles late in the ref period will prefer them to count for the next ref, especially if they already have a couple of good publications in this ref. Then the fourth question is why do people keep pestering me to put my articles in the university repository? For the very simple reason that this is a regulation that we need to meet for the ref. So they need to be available open access in the repository. And then the question, what makes an academic most valuable for the REF? Um, is it just as many uh, top publications as possible, regardless of the number of co-authors, uh, regardless of the content? Um, 
basically yes um although obviously for your promotion it will be far more beneficial if you have a few articles that are first authored or at least not only articles where you're the last author of 20 um, and um, in terms of content for your promotion obviously it will be more beneficial if you have a coherent research agenda but for the ref as such it doesn't matter whether you're the first author or the second author or the last author um, it's a publication and it's a publication that's going to be evaluated not the individual authors and then a question that kind of relates to uh, question three is it better to save up your publications um, and spread them out over different ref periods so you have top publications in every ref period um, i think it's not a bad career strategy but it all depends on whether you intend to go up for promotion or whether you intend to move institutions and we can talk a little bit about about that um, in the discussion section um, and then a very good question are publications employing methodologies that are less mainstream be assessed downwards i wish i knew the answer to that of course we all have a suspicion that they will be uh, on the other hand, if I look at the REF assessment panel, um, the national assessment panel, there are people there with very, very different backgrounds and very different um, research methodology um, use. So I would hope that publications are evaluated on their own merits. Um, but unfortunately, um, these evaluations are done behind closed doors and we will never know what actually happens behind closed doors. Uh, but I wouldn't automatically assume that articles with less mainstream uh, methodologies are downgraded as long as they comply with the matrix that I showed you earlier. And I think it's worth looking at that matrix again and again to frame your expectations of what a four-star piece of work is. Mm -hmm.